And for the second keynote, uh, we are happy to have uh, here Natasha Alamaki from EPFL. So Natasha is a very well-known uh, member of the community who has uh, achieved multiple awards. It's the list is even too long to go through them in detail. Uh, what, what I find uh, very interesting about Natasha, she's also founded her own startup, so it's very busy both on the academic world and the uh, entrepreneurial world right now. She is uh, also involved in the World Economic Forum, which I think is something quite unique in addition to all the other aspects. So without uh, much further ado, I would like to ask Natasha to come up to the stage and uh, we are very happy and look forward to your keynote. But before that, we will get a lay, and as I understand, this is a couple of years. discuss a little bit what are the right things to do in order not to just keep up with the hardware, but also in order to keep up with the future of the hardware, which is something that I have been struggling with in my PhD work and then much later in my research for a number of years now. And the talk that I'm going to give is complementary to that of once in the sense that it's going to be more higher level, a bit more academic as it should be. As Volker said, I represent my wonderful group, Data uh, Intensive Applications and Systems in, at EPFL, uh, who were actually all contributors to this, to this talk and the work that I'm talking about. And uh, we just also founded a, a spin-off from EPFL called Raw Labs. So, let me see how. Okay, so hardware has always been there for us. Um, to, to execute fast and then faster and then even more faster by creating mechanisms which allow us to parallelize, mostly to parallelize. Because if you look at the, um, over the years, over time, if you look at the um, uh, new advents of the hardware, they all translate to either explicit or implicit kinds of parallelism ever since the first years we covered delays with pipelining, uh, instruction level parallelism out of order processing, and then we have uh, simultaneous multi-threading and moving on uh, with the end of the Denard scaling, we move on to more explicit ways to parallelize, which is multi-core systems, and much more recently, but also much more excitingly, heterogeneous hardware, where we have cores that can do things, different things, uh, well, so we are not only called from the software point of view to divide our work and parallelize it and get scalability, but also we are called to assign work to very specific parts of the hardware. That kind of um, it can be our friend in the sense that we have a lot to exploit, but can also bully us a little bit because if we don't exploit it, bad things happen. So the headaches that are recurring that I'm going to talk about that I see are three, of three kinds, essentially. Uh, the first one is non-uniform communication across hardware components, which actually adds to not only lower performance numbers, but even worse, unpredictability for the future. The second one is underutilization of resources, a topic that's much underplayed in performance graphs and performance talks and performance targets and marketing numbers, but it's also important for the future. And a bit higher level, I'm going to leave a little mystery around that last one. I, I have to have a motto that involves sizing and fashion industry. So one size fits none um, anymore. So how do we actually interact not only with the hardware, but the rest of the environment, the data that's stored in the applications that are demanding for it? Um, a friend and uh, um, colleague at EPFL, uh, Ed Bunyon, whom most of you know as the co-founder of VMware, um, told me the other day when I was complaining to him about why, uh, what I do I have in, in, the, in the startup, I have such a hard time explaining it to people so they can see how they can use it, although I am convinced that this is a great thing, it's a great technology. He said the reason is that you don't, you're not building an aspirin, you're building a vitamin. So what you do is, by definition, 
fundamentally helpful, not only for now, but also for the future, and then builds a stronger system. So this was very inspiring to me in the sense that I think that all uh, the solutions that we're building in order to communicate well with the hardware have to be vitamins in order for us to be able to survive the next generation and then a generation after that of hardware platforms. So let's talk a bit more specifically about non-uniform communication. So non-uniform memory access is something that we all know from symmetric multiprocessors even, depending on the topology of the system, you get to be far or closer to memory. That has nothing to do with how you see memory. You see a shared memory system. But that has to do with how fast you access different parts of memory, depending on where they are in the, in the, in the topology. In today's multi-course, and this is a toy diagram there, you have cores. You have uh, these compute units that are called cores. Each one is supported by a cache subsystem. First level instruction cache, first level data cache. Then under that, you have a second level unified cache for both data instructions. Until now, you have these two levels dedicated to every core. And then you have a last level cache, which in our case here is L3, which is shared across all of the cores in a chip, in a socket. Okay? And then you have multiple sockets. And of course, there's memory uh, dims in this specific instance that I'm showing here. I have, uh, I'm picturing uh, a, a 12 core Intel Xeon. Each socket has 12 cores in it, and each core has two hardware threads in it. So for all practical purposes, I'm only showing four cores, but there's really 12 on this machine. You get 24 different computing units per, uh, per, per socket, 48 overall. So I'm going to show a little bit what non-uniformity means, right? So we partition data across different sockets. The memory looks as one, right? It's a, it's a shared memory system. But in reality, the DIMMs are distributed across the course. So this is just two sockets. If you have more sockets, depending on the topology, uh, things might change. So you have one column on one socket and one column stored in the other socket. If you need to scan the column, the bandwidth that you're going to enjoy are going to be wildly different, right? And that's non-uniform memory access today on multi-cores. So you see, conceptually, we still have non-uniformity in memory accesses. The other kind of non-uniformity that I want to talk about is a bit more subtle, has to do with how uh, hardware threads which is really the computers that you see at the high level of the application, how fast they communicate with one another. You assign work to cores. This has been taken over and executed by those hardware threads. Now, if those hardware threads are within the same core, they're going to go really fast. right? They're going to talk to each other really fast because they don't have to go through other parts of the system. If they are on different cores, they have to go through the last level um, uh, cache, so through L3. So they're gonna, the, the communication is going to be slower. And that's going to be even slower if they belong to different sockets. Overall, the performance is really unpredictable. And again, remember that I'm talking about two sockets here. If you have eight or 16 sockets, depending on the topology, unpredictability and variability increases. So if, you run, if we run now um, applications on this, on this uh, uh, a platform, we run OLTP and we run OLAP, we see very interestingly that OLTP is bound by the access latency to the memory. Okay, So you get a steep line up, up until two sockets, and then it, it drops back down, and, and it, goes, uh, it, goes, it plateaus after that. OLAP, pretty much the same thing, only after eight threads. Here I'm increasing the number of threads, because the, bind, the binding factor here, the bounding factor here, is the memory bandwidth. Okay, Now, the issue on both sides here is that what I've done in order to run the workloads is that I've partitioned all of the data statically across the cores, right? So I've I partitioned the columns in a static way. And that's an aspirin because it allows me to have essentially a uniform access at the very high level. But it's not really uniform because of the differences. So the vitamin here would be to be able to follow the workload's particularities, which actually chooses which are going to be the hot data, depending on where in the execution um, it is, and moves essentially the overhead from, from one part of the system to the other dynamically. If we can follow that with our partitioning scheme, something that's not really easy to do, but if we can do that, there you go. We have a vitamin, and we can solve this problem not only for this generation, but for the next generations to come. So. 
he, uh, uh, so we, we worked on this idea quite a bit, and we realized that essentially what we're talking about is variable communications across different pairs of threads, but then if we start summarizing a bit all these levels of variable communications, we will see that we have communication islands. So we have, for example, one island where in which if you stay within that island, you will have uniform communication. And that's a small island, and it only covers one core. And then the next core is also an island, and the core after that is also an island. And within each island, we have uniform communication. And then the same happens in the other socket. And then moving up a level, we have the big island, which covers the small islands. And in there, we also have uniform communication when we talk about threads that have to communicate, but they, they, they are in different small islands each and so on and so forth. Now, this concept is important because it's expandable in both dimensions, in the vertical dimension in which we expand the levels of islands that we have, but also the horizontal dimension in which we expand the number of sockets or we vary the topology, because you can have a parts of the subsets of the sockets defined as an island. So then you could sit down and write the algorithm, because you can see that we can partition the data start with a certain partitioning, and then as we assign jobs to cores, monitor statistically the usage and the communication overhead on a per-partition basis and how partitions communicate essentially through the work with each other and make sure to put partitions that communicate with each other that are used and consumed or have producer-consumer relationships across different um, silence in the same uh, overall overarching island. And that way, Having this, two, having this monitoring and behind the scenes changing the partitioning, adapting it to the workload, we can actually benefit from li near linear scalability. The bottom line is essentially the same one as I showed before, where OLTP went up and then went right back down. But, and then the top line, the dashed line, is the ideal, where we would have a perfectly partitionable workload on a shared nothing system. If you, we implemented these ideas and um, we resulted in, in, a, in a line that's very close to the naive one because it's adaptive. And um, that's the work of my student Danica Porovic and her PhD thesis. So talking about OLTP, which is bound by access latency, is half of the problem. Talking about OLAP, however, the problem transfers itself to memory bandwidth, right? So, Partitioning across sockets is something we do, again, in order to parallelize access to, to data, okay? Let's pretend that we have, on a machine with 16 sockets, we have one hot table. And that hot table, we partition it. So if we have one partition, we're gonna get very um, low throughput because everybody will want to access that partition, and we're, we're gonna get a lot of congestion. And so on and so forth, if we have 16 partitions, which is the most we can have across the 16 sockets, then we will get the highest possible throughput. Now, who can tell me from you how many partitions do we need to have if we have three hot tables? Okay, let's start. Who says 16 partitions? Nobody. Who says eight partitions? Okay, there's one person there. Everybody else is asleep. Okay, you guys, you, you need to vote on a number. Who says 16? Let's do this again. Okay, there's a couple more people who say 16. I'm gonna stop the voting here because my time is gonna end until you guys decide. But basically, the idea, I would, I would have said 16, just like that, right? If I didn't know from my student, Iraklis, that bandwidth is a problem, right? So if you have three hot tables and you go with 16, you're gonna, go, you're gonna end up with very little bandwidth. Why? Because you oversaturate. Saturating the bandwidth is good. Oversaturating it is bad. Because 16 partitions of eight, three hot tables, you get 48, right? 48 partitions in total. And they're hot tables, so everybody wants to access them. Right, so 48 partitions means that you oversaturate the bandwidth, which means at every socket, the system is trying to serialize stuff because you've oversaturated the bandwidth, and then the scheduler takes over, and then the scheduler imposes overhead and slows down the system and drives your throughput down. And look at this, even with two partitions per table, which means half the table in one socket, another half the table the other, which is six, level of six parallelism in total, you get much better bandwidth than you will get with 48. 
So that's another adaptivity mechanism that if you're around uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon at Heraclitus' talk, you're going to hear about, because this is work we did with a group at SAP that we work with. And uh, the, we show that with fewer partitions, depend, uh, calibrating the number of partitions, adaptive partitioning gives you higher throughput also in all of So adaptive partitioning is a vitamin. Okay? And it's a good one. And it's possible to do in a way that we anticipate what's going to happen in the future. The second recurring headache that I'm going to talk about is underutilization of hardware resources. Okay? And many of you know that we've been working on this stuff for years. I did my PhD in this work, and then on and on. And my students are running numbers now that actually don't look that much better than the numbers that I was running for my PhD work a while back. Basically, at the very high level, you've got five systems shown here. When you don't see system name, that's a system that's commercial. And the two systems on the left, SureMT and DBMSD, are disk-based systems. The three systems on the right are in-memory systems. And you can see that from 30,000 feet that at most 50% of the time, the processor is busy. The rest of the time, the processor is sitting around. Okay, that's a bad thing. Let me tell you now one thing. This is, has nothing to do with how fast these systems are, okay? Hyper, which is one of my favorite systems because it does really optimized um, uh, c compilation of all of the requests, <coughs> all of the requests right before they go to, to execution, ends up with a very short instruction stream which basically means that ends up with a lot less work to do than the other systems. So at times, it's up to 100 times faster than the other systems. But look at the, at the utilization of the hardware. It keeps the processor busy very little time, like 20% of the time. So that has nothing to do with your performance. Your performance is going to be, is going to be very different than this graph. But there's two things that happen, right? You have to use the course at 100%. Why? First of all, all of the part that's purple, means that you're missing out instruction opportunities, okay? So the processor is sitting there wanting to make your system faster and you're not giving it work to do, okay? So in this case, all of this represents opportunity for faster execution. The other issue is more subtle but a lot more important. It has to do with energy, okay? We are looking right now at half of the well, 37% according to, to, um, to numbers uh, uh, that you see from a lot of people who are doing research for years, uh, half of the time, 37 to 50% of the, of the time, of, of the energy that's spent in medium to large data centers are on the CPU, exclusive of memory or disks and all that stuff. And this, this is a scary thing. This means that, and, and about 12% of those CPUs are being used, which means that we're wasting energy on CPUs that are not working, on cores that are not working. Okay, and we're looking at about 13 billion a year of electricity bills in the US by 2020, and about 140, 150, if I remember correctly, million uh, of, of metric tons of carbon, okay? That's a lot. And we're, we can actually use that hardware much better and drive down those energy bills by a lot. So that's why this, this is important, and I hope you're convinced by now. So looking deeper into what happens with these stalls, I re-found with my students the same stuff that I had found during my PhD, that the big ticket items are first level instruction cache and last level cache data accesses, which means that first level instruction cache means that the processor wants to execute instructions but doesn't have any because they don't come fast enough from the first level instruction cache to feed it with stuff to do. And that the data is basically in memory when we need it and it has to travel all the way from memory up to the caches in order for us to use it. I'm going to stick to the instruction part because it's more important. If you have instructions to execute, even if you don't have the data that you need, you can execute the instructions that don't depend on that data. But if you don't have instructions, you don't have anything to do. So the processor is idle. Now, the aspirin here would be 
stuff that says, okay, I'm going to look at my processor and I'm going to optimize for this specific cache subsystem. The moment that changes, your solution is going to be less effective. The vitamin here is to actually do something, something radically different. And um, Pinar Tozun, who graduated from my group last year, had this fantastic research where she decided that instead of building the system, coding the system to be cash conscious, she's actually going to follow Chase instruction locality. And here's how. You have two transactions depicted on the left-hand side, transaction one and transaction two. Each transaction runs instructions one after the other. Now, the first part of the instructions is read, the second to, to, to notify that it's different than the next uh, part of the program, which is the yellow instructions, and the next part of the program is the, is the uh, green instructions, and then the last one is the blue instructions. And transaction two only uses the red, the yellow, and the, and the blue parts of instructions. And that came, of course, after an analysis that showed that there is tons of commonality across instructions that are run by the different kinds of transactions. Okay, so we did all the analysis and we realized that we have to pay attention to that commonality. Now, if we have the course in a conventional system, I'm showing four cores, each core has an instruction cache underneath it, and we're gonna count how many times we're gonna need to fill that instruction cache in order to execute the workload of these two transactions. Transaction one comes along, fills the instructions, cache with, with the red instructions, and of course is assigned to the first core, because that's the conventional way of doing things. So transaction one stays at that first core and continues by then refilling the cache with the yellow instruction while transaction two comes along, gets assigned to core number two, and fills that cache with the red instructions. And so on and so forth, until we reach at the end of the execution and we've got seven instru ca instruction cache refills, which means seven times the number of instructions that fit in the instruction cache, cache misses and stalls. Okay? Now, Pinar said, what we're going to do is a bit different. We're going to assign the first uh, transaction to the first core, but then when that instruction cache fills up, and we're about to take more capacity, this is because we need now the, the red, the, the yellow instructions. We're going to do two things. First of all, we're going to kick transaction one out of the first core before it gets to pollute that little instruction cache there. And we're going to bring in transaction two that we know needs this red instructions. So transaction two won't have to take any more misses. Then where will transaction one go? Well, if there is another cache that already has the yellow instructions in it, we'll definitely send it there. If there isn't, we're going to send it to another cache, but because it's much better for it to go and load these instructions to another cache and crash this one that we know is going to be useful. And of course, you run statistics and you collaborate a lot with the hardware and get hardware hints, so hardware software co-design is in order there to make that happen. So you move on for, uh, onward with that scheme, and you end up having a lot fewer cache fields than in the conventional scheme. Essentially, initially, you get the course to run transactions vertically, whereas in my little very toy example, you get the course to run transactions diagonally and having fewer cache fields. And essentially, the game is how to keep the housekeeping overhead really low. But if you work with the hardware hand in hand, you can do that, and we did it, and this system is running. This is just one of the techniques that Pinar came about. There's another one that's even slicker than slick, which actually will be presented on Thursday in her new paper that actually makes this, uh, this, this technique, refines this technique better. But already, with this, uh, with this game, she was able to drop uh, the instruction cache misses by 60%, which resulted in improved throughput of, of 70%. So that's the question. That wasn't me. Okay. Last but not least, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm going to, to then just gloss over that. Uh, I just couldn't. Okay, no problem. As long as not both of them are Okay, so um, this is just the last but not least. I really believe that what we're working on here is an ecosystem. Right, that we have to apply the culture of adaptivity in order to help us go through the hardware changes. And the adaptivity has also to do with our query engine. So as you all know, 
What we're building is a big data pipeline, which as we go up, we try to fit more and more data through narrower and narrower resource fuel levels. Okay? And that's our classical systems, and either we have one of them that says one VBMS fits all, but then, you know, Mike comes along and says, database one size does not fit all, because you, you would be much better if you paired the application with the data and optimized vertically, which is great, except we end up with a picture like this. Okay, which is currently the wealth of systems. So I'm going to say that one DBMS fits none because there is no one DBMS that, that will do all of the work even in a small to medium enterprise. And uh, today, for analytics, for transactions, for all of the stuff that people want to do today. And um, I, I've been lucky enough to start this, this company and be able to have this new experience of talking to customers and talking to people and this gets more and more enforced. So the work that we've been doing is, is essentially to uproot everything that has been static, which is not much, it's just the database and the query engine. So we don't have any databases anymore and we don't have a query engine anymore. The paradigm shift is as follows. Instead of having the data adapt structurally to the engine by loading or ingesting or, or transforming or any way you want to call this, this uh, this, this, this uh, uh, philosophy that we've been following. We want to access only the useful raw data, but it's not clear which data. We don't want to copy or alter the data, also for reasons of data being tinted. We don't want to be locked into a vendor in order to change or access our data. And we want a custom engine that will do just what we want that day, at that time, with the data that we just received when combined with the rest of our big database. So we want to reverse this trend and make the database adapt to the raw data as opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. And we also don't want the query to have to use available resources in the database because those resources may be insufficient or inadequate. So we would like to also reverse that trend and make the database to adapt to the query and create the resources that the query will need. Code, generate the operators that the query will need before it actually goes to the raw data. I have a, a, a we, we have put a system together, it's called RawDB, and it's a, essentially an evolving query engine which allows people to create a custom database and the custom database system for their own needs, but they don't even know that this is happening because this is happening in the background. All people do is that they log into the system, they point to their files, and they run SQL queries. So, um, I'm going to skip over this example, but this is all published in Manos Carpathiotakis' thesis work in papers, and I'm just going to say that if we keep on creating aspirates between us uh, to fix problems that come up uh, because of new requirements or new hardware or new applications or new anything, we're going to be playing this, uh, lagging behind and really sweating behind every single one of those changes. We're going to be creating vitamins, and that's the way we're going to be good friends with the hardware and the applications and the data. And the solutions that I presented today are three. Adaptive data positioning for all open OLTP on highly variable communication platforms. Chasing instruction locality to finally get rid of those instruction stalls that have been there since 15 years ago. And just-in-time data management for the today's demanding and very dynamic applications. Thank you very much.